I now look to Secretary Jay Johnson to close the case for the opposition tonight. Good evening. Good evening. Madam President, Mr. Secretary. <laughs> Future secretaries in this room of students. I compliment Admiral Blair, Ms. Heinrichs, Cameron for doing your best <laughs> to To make sense out of nonsense. I oppose the motion that is before you tonight. I speak, as Cameron referenced, from the vantage point of having served in both the Obama and Trump administrations. I served as designated survivor on January 20, 2017. In the presidential line of succession, I had to absent myself from Washington, D.C. on Inauguration Day, and therefore served for seven hours and 32 minutes as the entirety of Donald Trump's cabinet. <laughs> I do make reference, I do make reference frequently in my public remarks that I am therefore the first person to resign from Donald Trump's administration. <laughs> What was President Barack Obama's foreign policy? It was not revolutionary. It was not new. It was based upon a traditional, fundamental American ideal that the United States of America should occupy the role as a leader in our global community and as a beacon for freedom for human rights, for gender equality, for the right to choose one's own leaders, for freedom of religion, freedom of speech. Those were the things that for eight years the Obama administration championed in a very complex and often unpredictable world. As I mentioned, those principles are not unique. They go back to FDR. Truman, Eisenhower, Kennedy, Reagan, Bush. So in this sense, tonight's proposition is, who do you favor, Trump versus every other modern president of the United States and their policies? What is the Trump foreign policy? There is no policy. Let's be clear about that. There is no policy. Foreign policy in this administration is day trading driven by emotion, ego, tweet after an hour of Fox and Friends, impulse, peak, or a New York real estate deal, driven by bluster, threats, and a drive to get a deal. Tariffs are slapped down like playing cards without regard to the consequences of American businesses that depend upon tariffed goods for their supplies and without regard to the American consumer for whom the expense is passed on. It is schizophrenic. On the one hand, our president tells us no more foreign wars, no more deployments of ground troops, yet threatens intervention in Venezuela. It is a policy that rejects our best friends and offends our best friends and coddles our enemies. We all heard Rebecca say that the Trump administration has gotten tough on our enemies. I heard that, and I asked myself, who is she talking about? Perhaps some acting assistant secretary of state somewhere, or an assistant secretary of state of defense in the D-ring, but she's not talking about the president of the United States, who manages to spend 90 minutes on a phone call with Vladimir Putin, and not once, defends our democracy against foreign influence in that conversation. Perhaps aside from the safety of the American people, 
is the second most important job of a president of the United States. At its most coherent, the Trump foreign policy is simply, if you serve my interest, or if I think you serve my interest, I don't care what you do to your own people or to your neighbors. Let me focus on the manifestations of the Obama and Trump foreign policies in three distinct specific areas. Number one, as has been so eloquently mentioned before, the number one issue for my 23-year-old daughter and for, I suspect, a lot of you in this room who are going to inhabit this planet for the next 65, 70, or maybe 75 years is climate change. In 2016, the United States government signed up to the Paris Accords with 185 other nations. That wasn't hard. The Paris Accords basically say, create your own standards and live up to them. Write your own report card and just live up to it. And by the United States and China together signing on, 40% of carbon emissions, carbon emissions had signed on to that deal. In 2017, our current president withdrew the United States of America from the Paris Climate Change Accords. He quoted, he said, a great line that his speechwriter must have written for him. I represent Pittsburgh and not Paris, except somebody forgot to tell him that Pittsburgh has moved on from hard industry and is now remaking itself into a financial and high-tech center. And the mayor of Pittsburgh said, excuse me, I support climate change, uh, addressing climate change. 80% of the city of Pittsburgh voted for Hillary Clinton. Issue, issue, issue two, issue two, which we haven't talked about much tonight, refugee resettlement. Refugee resettlement. We are in the midst now, and we were four years ago, in a worldwide refugee crisis. In late 2015, early 2016, just when candidate Trump was making the illegal and unconstitutional suggestion that we should ban all Muslims from immigrating to the United States, our then president decided to up our game and admit 10,000 Syrian refugees and 85,000 refugees overall. I must tell you, from my homeland security standpoint, where we want to buy down risk, I greeted that with some trepidation, but understood that the most powerful nation on Earth can certainly absorb a fraction of 1% of a worldwide refugee crisis. And we did, and we met, and we exceeded President Obama's goals without shortcutting our security. Issue three, last but not least. This is an episode that we don't talk a lot about but it is probably the thing for which I am most proud during the Obama administration. In the fall of 2014, our nation was gripped by an Ebola crisis, the viral deadly disease, the virus from West Africa. People were nervous every time a passenger on a commercial flight heading into the United States from wherever got sick in the restroom, it became a matter for the Secretary of Homeland Security to address. My daughter was put out of her college room by her roommate because she had a head cold, and she'd never been to the continent of Africa. We were wrestling with what to do. We considered suspending visas from the three affected West African countries. I must tell you, as the Homeland Security Secretary of our nation, I considered, as a matter of buying down risk, suspending visas from the three affected West African nations. Samantha Power, our ambassador to the United Nations, 
convinced me of a higher purpose. And she was right. I'll never forget, I looked at the list of nations that had suspended travel from West Africa. And then I looked at the list of nations that had not. And I said to myself, the United States of America belongs in the latter category, not the former. And if we go to the former, a whole lot of people in the latter are going to follow us. The United States has to set the example and lead. And we did. Instead of suspending visas, we funneled travelers from West Africa to five airports where they received heightened health screening. And after that point, not one person affected by the Ebola virus entered our country without our knowledge receiving our treatment. Like other nations represented in this room, we sent our healthcare community to West Africa. We sent our military to West Africa. The United States saw the higher calling and led, and we stamped out that deadly virus. Now, you can be for America first. Americans can be for Americans first. The British can be for Great Britain first. Canadians can be for Canada first. But each of us are not the only nations on Earth. All of us must realize, all of us must realize that in addition to being proud citizens of our own countries, we are co-inhabitants on an increasingly interconnected and smaller planet. While our landlord looks down upon us, wondering whether this great experiment, humanity on Earth, is going to succeed or fail. I am an optimist. My law partner, my late law partner, Theodore Sorensen, who was John F. Kennedy's speechwriter, used to say, democracies self-correct. Democracies have the capacity to self-correct. I am an optimist. Every time I come to this university and I come to this room, this is my fourth trip here. And when I see the energy and the passion of you future leaders in this room, I am incredibly optimistic about the future of our world. Thank you very much.